subscribe to our channel and press the bell icon so that you do not miss any video lesson from Rao's IS. Hello and welcome to Daily News Simplified, an answer to what, why and how of newspaper reading. Today we are going to analyze the Hindu dated 5th of June 2020. Displayed on the screen is a list of articles that we are going to discuss today. Time stamping for the same has been provided in the description of the video. Let's begin our analysis. Page number 7 of today's newspaper has a very interesting read about embracing alternative protein. Now we are aware of the fact that we are talking about COVID-19 lockdown and some of the positive impact in terms of improvement in weather and other aspects. So there is a debate going on which talks about how to make human lifestyle much more sustainable for the planet Earth. And in this context, today is World Environment Day. So from the perspective of coming prelims examination, World Environment Day is celebrated on 5th June of every year and is the United Nations principal vehicle for encouraging awareness and action for the protection of our environment. So this is the important aspect that is related to World Environment Day. Now when we talk about this particular article, this article basically focuses the role of our food choices and the kind of environmental degradation that we have seen in the recent past. Now in this context, the author highlights that as the demand for animal protein is rising across the world, the suppliers are increasingly adopting intensive animal farming. This intensive animal farming is also known as factory farming. As already mentioned, the focus of the article is to ensure sustainable means and livelihood for people on the earth, thereby improving the quality of environment on earth. In this context, the author tries to establish that this approach of animal rearing is devastating to the environment. So in the perspective of this article, we are going to comprehensively discuss most environmental impact. In the end of the article, the author discusses the alternatives as well as what can be done to wean away people from animal protein without the compromising of nutritional aspect. Now let's focus on the important question that is what is factory farming? Now there are some aspects of factory that we can easily understand. First, when we talk about factory, it means it has to be mass production. Second important aspect is investment in machinery as well as in technology. So if we include these two aspects in the factory farming, we can say that large scale industrial animal or agriculture production for meat, egg and dairy can be considered to be factory farming. It is a style of animal husbandry that is designed to maximize production while minimizing the cost. To achieve this, the people who practice this agribusiness keep livestock such as cattle, poultry, fish at a high stocking density at large scale and using modern machinery, biotechnology and global trade in order to generate maximum profit and revenue for themselves. Now here it is also important to highlight that the main products of this industry are meat, milk and eggs and they are produced for human consumption. Now this brings us to a very important question when we are producing something like meat, milk or eggs that too for human consumption, how can it actually cause damage to the environment? And this is what the focus is in terms of discussion. Now when we talk about any kind of factory farming, it uses vast tracts of land and these vast tracts of lands are used to produce animal feed. Now here it is important for us to understand that the crop that is fed to industrially reared animals worldwide could feed an extra 4 billion people on this planet. With this you can understand that the use of vast tract of lands to produce animal feed is actually a wastage in that sense. Apart from that, the grazing that is done by these animals which are reared in factories are also causes of deforestation. The demand for livestock pastures is a major driver of deforestation. The Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations has estimated that 70% of the land formerly supporting Amazon rainforest has been turned into grazing lands. So you can see that the kind of environmental impact the usage of vast tracts of land has brought in terms of factory farming. Second important aspect that we are discussing is the quantities of water that is used to raise these animals. Now when we talk about the kind of choice that we have, if we have to water crops or we have to water farm animals, providing drinking water for billions of animals each year and cleaning away the filth in factory farms 
transport trucks and slaughterhouse, the animal agriculture industry has huge impact on water supply. You would be surprised to know that when we talk about one pound of beef consumes around 1581 gallons of water, which is roughly as much as the average American uses in 100 showers. So you can imagine the kind of water wastage that is done in terms of generating factory farming and this kind of use cannot be limited or reduced in any sense. Now third and a very detrimental aspect of this factory farming is the use of antibiotics and its impact. Now when we talk about antibiotics, it basically has impact on water bodies, human health. It also affects air pollution and it also leads to biodiversity. So we'll be discussing each of these topics one by one. Now when we talk about any kind of factory farmed animals, they produce more than 1 million tons of manure on a daily basis. Now this animal waste contains undigested antibiotics which are given to the livestock to prevent the spread of disease in their confined living conditions. This waste is usually stored in large open air lagoons which are essentially lakes full of animal waste. These lagoons can leak and spill often during the times of flooding and have actually spilled over to other water bodies and this has led to contamination and killing of fish population. The next important aspect is the adverse impact on the human health. Now there is an overwhelming evidence that the routine prophylactic use of antibiotics is leading to the rise of antibiotic resistant superbugs. At the same time, World Health Organization has issued warnings that if we do not do something to curb antibiotic use in both humans and animal medicine, we will face a post-antibiotic era where currently treatable diseases will once again kill people. Third important aspect is the air pollution. Over 37% of methane emission results from factory farming. You must be aware of the fact that methane has a global warming potential which is 20 times higher than the carbon dioxide. Now when we put all these factors together, this leads to loss in biodiversity. Now due to eutrophication, acidification, pesticides and herbicides, we have seen that biodiversity loss has increased multiple times in last few decades. And since we are focusing on factory farming, this has also led to reduction in genetic diversity of livestock and this in turn has led to loss of traditional breeds. So in this particular fashion, we can see that the kind of damage this practice has done to the environment. Apart from that, this has also supported monoculture. Now, when we talk about any kind of factory farming, we need to support livestock industry. And for this particular purpose, a small group of commodity crops have taken up the majority of world's agriculture land. You can take the example of United States where corn, wheat, rice and soybean are planted at unprecedented rate. Yet only a small percentage of these crops is used to feed people. Most of these crops are basically used for animal feed only. So what is the crux of this entire discussion? You can understand that as the global demand for cheap meat grows, the expansion of agriculture land is putting more and more pressure on our forests, rivers and oceans and this is contributing to deforestation, soil erosion, marine pollution zones and the global biodiversity crisis. So this brings us to the last part of discussion, what we can do to stop this kind of environmental degradation. Now the first thing that we can do is the diversification of the protein source. Right now in the current context, protein source is primarily derived from animal products and hence diversification is the key in order to stop this kind of factory farming. So what is the suggested mechanism in this context? We need to reorient ourselves for pulses and other protein rich vegetable products. At the same time, the author accepts that that this may not be enough and hence not only the plate has to expand, but also we need to search for alternative proteins. Now we are aware of the fact that world over companies are trying to actually produce alternative proteins which are in a way upgraded version of meat, eggs and dairy from plant or crop ingredients or directly from animal cells. You might recall for this particular purpose, lab created meat has also been tested. There are multiple advantages of such kind of usage 
these food satisfy consumer and producer without taking away their choice it means that the kind of food choice what the people want to exercise they can retain the same second they taste almost the same and their nutritional value is much more higher and controlled moreover the process aspect is same as we do with the conventional animal products and the greatest benefit that we can draw is that they are vastly better for planet's health in the end we would like to highlight that food security and agriculture income are among the nation's major challenges in the coming years we should turn this crisis into an opportunity by stimulating research and entrepreneurship in alternative proteins and in this particular way we will not only save this environment but will also ensure sustainable cohabitation on this planet page number 10 of today's newspaper has an item which talks about india australia meet strengthen ties the subheading of the article reads that modi morrison take relationship to comprehensive strategic partnership at virtual summit now this topic is important more from the perspective of mains examination and hence it will be covered under general studies paper 2 and will be covered under international relations as a sub topic it will come under bilateral regional global groupings and agreements involving india and or affecting india's interests now here it is important to highlight that virtual bilateral summit between prime minister narendra modi and his australian counterpart scott morrison is a very big deal for both the countries it is important because it takes place at a time when both the countries that is australia and india find themselves under attack from china so in this backdrop let's first understand the context of the news so this is first ever virtual summit between india and australia and it signed the important deal for reciprocal access to each other's military bases for logistical support and this is very important for india's defense need as well second important aspect is that countries upgraded their relations to a comprehensive strategic partnership we'll be talking about that in the further discussion and the third is discussion at the summit ranged around ongoing coronavirus pandemic reforms at wto challenges in the indo pacific and combating the threat of terrorism now it is important for us to understand the background of this meeting so that we have better grasp on the entire thing now it is important for us to understand the backdrop of the entire situation and how china's relationship with india and china's relationship with australia have worsened in the recent past and in this context how this entire thing becomes important now we are aware of the fact that the bonhomie after the informal summits of wuhan summit and mamallapuram paved way for better relationship between india and china however the recent development of covid-19 pandemic support to pakistan on the cause of jammu and kashmir and border disputes between india and china in ladakh region has further worsened the entire situation similarly when we talk about the relationship between australia and china we know that the economic relationships were thriving especially in the backdrop of rcep agreement however when australia raised the claim of independent investigation in order to understand the origin and genesis of covid-19 china reacted by putting restrictions on beef and barley imports from australia so in this mechanism we can see that china is entering into arm testing mechanism in order to get a better deal for itself especially after the covid-19 pandemic and hence this meeting is very important from that perspective now let's try to understand what are the outcomes of this virtual meeting some of the outcomes of this virtual meeting are very significant for both the countries so both the countries announced that they have signed seven agreement and this also includes long awaited mutual logistic support agreement now here it is also important for us to highlight that what is the meaning of mutual logistic support agreement or mlsa Now when you talk about this particular agreement that is MLSA it allows two countries to use each other's military base for logistic support and this includes food water and petroleum as both countries have entered into this agreement this has strengthened the defense ties between two countries apart from this the two countries also released a declaration on shared vision for maritime cooperation in the indo pacific now according to this declaration a rule based maritime order that is based on the respect for sovereignty and international law particularly the united nation convention on law would be implemented in the region as we are already aware of the fact that china has increased its presence in south china sea and also in the indian ocean region and hence an arrangement of such type is the need of our for both the countries 
we are aware of the fact that China is increasing its bases through defense and strategic partnership and in this context, China is increasing its presence in the region. And hence, both Australia and India agreed to exchange views on their respective approaches to South Pacific region under Australia's Pacific Step Up and India's Forum for India-Pacific Island Corporation with a view to cooperate in the region. So we can see that one of the primary outcome of this particular meeting is to limit China in its expansive approach. Now let's try to understand how China plays a significant role in this India-Australia ties. Now we are aware of the fact that China has been reacting against Australia for pushing the international investigation into the source and initial handling of the coronavirus pandemic. In this sense, we have already highlighted that China has put restrictions on beef and barley imports from Australia. Apart from that, when we talk about Indian context, Indian and Chinese soldiers are engaged in a standoff in multiple positions in eastern Ladakh. Now, in such a scenario, when China is pushing against both Australia and India, the Memorandum of Understanding and Defence Cooperation is the natural order for the day. Under MLSA, both the countries will be extending support to each other in combined exercises, training, humanitarian and disaster relief operations. And hence, the use of military bases can be used on the reciprocal basis according to both the countries. So this is what the important aspect is. Now in this meeting between Australia and India, the Quad also figured in the talks with the two leaders reaffirming their commitment to the ongoing consultation which were upgraded to ministerial level in the September of 2019. For all those people who are not aware what Quad is, it is basically an informal strategic quadrilateral security dialogue or QSD that was initiated by Japan's Prime Minister Shinzo Abe in 2007. The motivation to launch Quad or QSD in this sense was largely in response to China's growing power and influence in the region. Now, these talks are also very important from the perspective of ASEAN. We know that India has withdrew from RCEP because the interests of its farmers and workers were not protected under that. And it was expected that China will use ASEAN mechanism in order to dump goods and services into India. At the same time, when we talk about India-Australia dialogue, importance to ASEAN and ASEAN-based institutions was very high. Both the countries reiterated the centrality of ASEAN when it comes to strong regional architecture. And both the countries agreed to continue to work with East Asia Summit and other ASEAN-led institutions. The Asian Defence Ministers Meeting, that is ADMM+, Indian Ocean Naval Symposium and Indian Ocean Rim Association to realise long-term objective for this region. So in this sense, we can see that the kind of way forward that we can see for India's association with Australia and rest of the ASEAN countries can be channelized in a particular way that it can fight Chinese influence in that particular region. And hence, from the perspective of this particular paper, India's policy to look east seems to be a perfect fit in this scenario. Page number 7 of today's newspaper highlights a very important piece of information which is more of a debate and this is important from the perspective of essay writing as well as from the perspective of ethics and in this context this article is very important. The heading of the article reads are social media platforms the arbiter of truth. Now we need to understand why this has become an issue. You might be aware of the fact that there is an ongoing massive protest that has erupted in the US following the death of African-American man George Floyd. Some of you might also recall that in 1991, similar event happened when police ill-treated Mr. Rodney King on account of traffic violation. Now, once these protests spread across US on a wide scale, US President Donald Trump tweeted that when looting starts, shooting also. And this particular tweet by Mr. Donald Trump was tagged as something which can incite violence. And hence, the social media platform Twitter called out some of the President Donald Trump's tweet as incorrect information and as against its policies. Now, when we talk about social media platform, we also need to talk about other platforms. In this case, the kind of stand Twitter took, Facebook did not try to take a similar stand. And it said that they did not want to be the arbiter of truths. Now, in this context, we need to understand what is social media and how social media influence our day-to-day -day life. Now in this context, whenever we try to define social media, we know that social media refers to the kind of websites or applications 
that are specifically designed to allow people to share content. The idea is to share content quickly, efficiently and in real time. At the same time, the basic objective of social media is the involvement of individual and dissemination of public discourses. And the kind of reach social media is having in our time, when we talk about Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, we can say that they have a say in the lives of billions of people and they have transformed the way we live in. So in this context, we can safely say that social media basically feeds on people's attention and they're looking for means for continuous engagement. Now, this topic has become important because the social media platform of Twitter has emerged as the interpreter of truth. Now, in this context, we need to understand what is truth in social media. Now, when we talk about truth on social media, the definitions can vary a lot. Now, in this sense, we'll be focusing on author's perspective here. Now, according to authors, truth is an accident on these platforms. In simple words, it is difficult to find truth. And moreover, it is not difficult. Actually, it is as difficult to find a needle in the haystack. Now, we also need to understand why social media faces such kind of situation. Now, the situation is basically rooted in the kind of business model they have engaged into. They are the creators of engagement who wish to usurp all human attention. Their entire business model feeds on that. And that is why the definition of truth varies across the platform. The social media platform, in order to engage more people into it, they really do not care what is being communicated through their platform. All they are here is to serve their business model, which is based on the reaction on the post. Also important here is to highlight that if they are forced to take responsibility of something, they say that they are private platforms and they have their own rules and regulations and community guidelines. And at times, this becomes very subjective and difficult to interpret as well. And hence comes to forth the most inherent question, that is, can social media platforms can act as arbitrators? Now, here in this context, we are focusing more about the US system or the European system of social media regulation. Now, we are aware of the fact that social media has a lot of legislative authority and prerogative to regulate their content. Now, in the sense that we are aware of the fact that national laws allow content monitoring. For instance, Communication Decency Act in the US empowers the intermediaries, that is these social media platforms, to make decisions regarding content. Second important aspect is the nature of the private entity they are. So the platforms have the right to choose the type of content that they want to spread or engage. Third power comes from the contract that is signed between the service provider as well as the service user. So the user platform relationship is governed by contracts and these contracts give a great deal of power to these social media platforms. Apart from that, national interest is also of the paramount value and hence practical consideration such as illegal or harmful content, including terrorist actions or suicide attempts need to be censored as well. Now, in this way, we can see that the social media platforms are very powerful in terms of regulating the content. And with these powers come the responsibility of managing the content at the same time of arbitration as well. Now, this brings us to the next important question, and that is why it is important to regulate the online platforms. Now, the first thing is that many platforms enjoy a monopoly and this kind of monopoly can actually be used to sway the opinion of people in a particular direction. And hence, these platforms are very important in terms of opinion making and alter the outcomes of many situations. We are also aware of the fact that when we talk about Arab Springs, they were also fueled by social media platforms. Now, whenever you talk about monopoly of any kind in which we are swaying the opinion of people, we also need to focus upon the monetary aspect of this entire scheme. In this sense, in the media business, for example, the advertising market is moving towards specific platforms. And this basically makes some of the platforms much more strong than the other platforms. And hence, we need to regulate this online platform. Third important aspect is that there is lack of transparency accountability in decision making and there have been allegations of bias and discrimination on the platform. Recently we have seen that in the case of TikTok there has been discrimination in terms of imposition of community guidelines and hence there is a need to regulate the online platform. 
Now, when we talk about any kind of regulation, we need to understand that regulation has to be much more practical. At the same time, it should be judicious in nature. And hence, we need to define the kind of regulation that we are looking for. In this sense, the most important aspect is that we should avoid one size fits all approach. As we have seen in the Indian case, the generic regulations in Indian government's intermediary guidelines of December 2018, something similar should not be attempted in case of regulation of the social media platforms. So the authors are very clear about one particular thing, that the kind of regulation we are looking for, the regulation should have purpose in mind. And the purpose will change with the social media platform as well as with its reach. Second thing that the authors have highlighted is that regulation of procedural aspects must be preferred. And for this particular thing, the authors have highlighted many cases. You should note such cases in order to be used in your ethics paper as well as in the paper of essay. Now, in this context, the authors have highlighted that German law requires social media companies with over 2 million, that is 20 lakh registered users in Germany to put in place process to receive user complaints and disable access to manifestly illegal content. So similar kind of a procedure can be implemented in other platforms as well and in other countries. Apart from that, companies are also required to improve their transparency mechanism and make public disclosures of how they handle complaints. Now, in this context, we have just highlighted the problem with TikTok. The way they are implementing their community guidelines is very subjective in nature. And next important aspect is the law fines companies not for failing to remove the content, but for not having the robust grievance redressal mechanism. And this is the most important aspect of this entire discussion. The authors have highlighted few other mechanisms like an independent watchdog, like Facebook's oversight board. Apart from that, US Section 230 of CDA is considered to do regulation without stifling innovation. So these are important from the perspective of understanding and you can actually keep a note of them in order to be used in your essay or ethics paper. The basic thing that we can understand from this particular discussion is first, can social media platforms be arbiter of truth? Second important aspect is why social media platforms are expected to perform such a role? And third, if any kind of regulation can be done, what is the inspiration that is available from across the world? Page number 14 of today's newspaper has an important piece which talks about no action against employers for not paying wages, Supreme Court. Now, you must be aware of the fact that Ministry of Home Affairs has issued a notification dated 29th of March 2020. Through this notification, Ministry of Home Affairs has directed all industries, shops and commercial establishments to pay wages to their workers on due date without any deduction for the period. Now, we are aware of the fact that because of COVID-19 lockdown, the industry has faced unprecedented losses and hence many of them are not in a position to pay wages to their employees. And in this context, a petition has been filed in the Supreme Court. This petition has been filed by the owners of small commercial establishments, industries, shops and factories against the order of Ministry of Home Affairs. The petitioners have claimed that the pandemic had already driven them to the brink of insolvency and in such a situation, they are not in a position to meet their basic expenses. How can they actually pay the wages for their employees? So paying wages to the workers in such a situation when no work is done and moreover, no sale has been registered, it would be impossible for these organizations to survive in this situation and hence they filed a petition in the Supreme Court. Now, once the petition has been filed in the Supreme Court, government clarified through its Attorney General. Now, Attorney General Mr. K.K. Venugopal said that the notification was no longer operational and most of the workers had already returned to their villages. Apart from that, he also clarified that the measure was taken by the government to prevent perpetration of financial crisis within the lower strata of society, labors and salaried employees. Apart from that, Attorney General also clarified that notification is no longer valid and need not be adjudicated by the Supreme Court as such. Now here two, three points are important from the perspective of understanding. Even if the government says that the notification is no longer valid, then also there is a legal responsibility of all these businesses to pay these employees for the period 
for which they haven't been in a position to earn anything. So legal responsibility without this clarity cannot be discounted in this case and hence the government stand looks to be short-sighted in its approach. Keeping this thing into mind, the Supreme Court has given its decision on the same issue. Supreme Court clarified that the government must be restrained from taking any coercive action against the private employers for not paying full wages for the period of the lockdown. Apart from that, the Supreme Court also started another Apart from that, Supreme Court also questioned government's authority to compel private employers to pay full wages to their workers and they wanted to know the justification for the same. The point that Supreme Court highlighted is that government has to act as a facilitator not only for the people from the lower classes but also from the people who are owning some organization. And in this context, the government's responsibility should be equal for both of them. In this context, the court has stated that government can give such directions to governmental authorities but could not force private players to pay wages in such financially distressing times. So in this way, Supreme Court has highlighted not only in terms of legal responsibility but also in terms of equal protection not only to the people who are suffering but also the people who are owning organizations. At the same time, it is important here to highlight that the court said that it will pronounce its judgment on this particular case on 12th of June 2020. Once this decision is out, then the Supreme Court decision will help us in understanding more about what are the rights of people who own organization and they're expected to pay salaries to the people. Page number 14 of today's newspaper highlights an important information which talks about India vows 15 million to vaccine alliance. Now recently British Prime Minister Mr. Boris Johnson hosted virtual global vaccine summit and Indian Prime Minister also participated in that. During the address, Indian Prime Minister pledged 15 million to Gavi, the International Vaccine Alliance. Now this topic is important more from the perspective of prelims examination and will come under current events of national and international importance. Now we have to know more about Gavi Alliance in terms of the organization. Now, Gavi Alliance, which is also known as Global Alliance for Vaccine and Immunization, is a public-private international health partnership that aims to save children's lives and improve people's health by increasing access to vaccine in poor and developing countries. From the perspective of examination, please try to remember that the focus is children's life. So, in simple words, it is a global vaccine alliance with the goal of creating equal access to new and underused vaccine for children living in the world's poorest countries. Now, in order to achieve its goal, Gavi brings together all the stakeholders which include donor governments, developing countries, World Bank, UNICEF, WHO and many NGOs like Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, International Finance and Development Organization and the pharmaceutical industry into a one decision-making body and that is called as Gavi Lines. This alliance was started in 2000 and is based in Geneva, Switzerland. Now, this organization has completed 20 years of its existence. During this period, from its inception, it has saved 370 million child death by immunizing them against life-threatening disease such as hepatitis B, polio, tetanus, etc. Now, its method of operation is very simple. Countries that are eligible for funding draw up the plan for immunization program. After drawing the plan, they apply for funding and then implement the immunization program on their own way. Since this method keeps into account the local needs and hence this program is less bureaucratic in nature and hence the effectiveness of this program is very high. Now from the perspective of examination, you should also know that India has been actively involved with Gavi, especially after 2002. India started receiving its support for its immunization program. And apart from that, India is the largest supplier of vaccine to Gavi with 55% of its vaccine coming from India only. From the perspective of examination, you may also note that Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation have invested close to US dollar 1.5 billion. Apart from that, Gavi has observer status in the World Health Assembly. This topic is important from the perspective of prelims examination and in today's quiz, there will be a question on Gavi as well. Page number one of today's newspaper highlights a point of contention between India and China. It talks about 
India China dialogue to focus on three areas. Now this topic has been covered multiple times in last few days. In the context, you must be aware of the fact that there is ongoing standoff between India and China. At several locations at the line of actual control in Ladakh and Sikkim, Chinese troops have moved in large number into Indian territory at the points of Pangangso, Galwan and Gogra in Ladakh and Nakula in Sikkim. India has seen such kind of incursion in the past as well, but China has maintained massive buildup on its side. To resolve the issue, the first ever talks between Chinese and Indian Lieutenant General is expected to take place to ease the tension at the line of actual control. Now, in this context, we need to focus on three basic areas. First is the Galwan area as mentioned, then Pangangso and Gogra. Now, when we talk about Galwan area, this area has never been the area of contention between India and China. And hence, this is the first time when China has staked claim on this particular area or has moved its forces in this particular region. India has clarified its position to Chinese delegation on the similar aspect. Now, the second important aspect is Pangangso. Now, Pangangso is an important focus area as Chinese troops have taken position in large numbers at finger 4A. So, you can see here this is Pangangso and this is highlighted in terms of fingers as well, finger 2 and finger 4. Now, India holds around one third of the 135 kilometer boomerang shaped lake that is highlighted through this circle. Now, India has always held this area of finger 4 while it claims that area so far as the finger 8 which extend to the Chinese occupation of Aksai Chin. And third such standoff has taken place at Kogra. Now, when we talk about this Lieutenant General level meeting, we need to understand what is the primary objective of India. The primary objective of India is very simple. First, maintain the position of before May 5th level. And second important aspect which India would highlight is de-escalation of the entire situation in which de-induction of troops by China. Now, in this Lieutenant General level meeting, the Indian side will be represented by General Officer Commanding of the Leh Headquartered 14 Corps. And this meeting will be held at Chushul Moldo border. Now, we have already discussed about India-China problems on the DNS of 21st of May and on 25th of May. It is expected that if you want to understand the entire genesis, you should go through the 21st of May DNS, which is done by Mangal sir, in which he has also quoted about LCRT reference on the similar topic. On 25th of May, this article has been covered by me with special emphasis on the origins of India-China boundary dispute and the cross connection with the Bhutan angle. So you can refer to these DNSs, that is 21st of May done by Mangal sir and on 25th of May which was done by me. With this we have reached to the question of the day. Question of the day reads, consider the following about global alliance for vaccine and immunization that is Gavi. First, India is the largest manufacturer of Gavi vaccine. Second, UK is the leading donor for vaccine alliance. Which of the statements given above is are correct? Option A reads 1 only, Option B reads 2 only, Option C reads both 1 and 2 and Option D reads neither 1 nor 2.